I'm, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker. Um, believe it or not, Wendy Kopp was one of the first speakers we ever had in entrepreneurship at UNC. She talked to my class of about 40 students uh, seven years ago in Gardner. Uh, and Teach for America has come a long way, and I guess we have too. Uh, we've gone from 40 to almost 400, so 10x, and Wendy and her group has grown uh, remarkably as well. So without any more uh, ado, uh, this is Wendy Kopp. Hi, Wendy. Hi. This is, this is very cool, the wonders of technology. Can you all hear me, actually? Yes? Yes? Raise your hands if yes. No? I, yes. Yay! Okay. I just had to verify that before I rambled at you for the next few minutes. Um, well, I thought I would share a bit about my journey over the last 23 years since I was sitting in your seats. Um, and, and, you know, and also I, I'm dying to share with you why it is that I've stayed with this for 23 years, why I feel, you know, greater urgency today this idea because, it, you know, really it was a couple of things coming together. I had become very focused on this issue of, you know, I'm not sure the term existed then, but educational inequity. Just the fact that in our country, a place that obviously aspires to be a place of equal opportunity, really where you're born determines your educational outcomes. I, I had grown up completely oblivious to this fact. I'd grown up in a pretty secluded, homogenous somewhat privileged community um, in Dallas, Texas. Um, and I got to Princeton, and of course, you can't begin to see the depths of educational inequity at Princeton. But um, but I, I became exposed to it through through my freshman year roommate, actually, had gone to public schools in the Bronx. And as a public policy major uh, and just a concerned college student, I got more and more into it, organized a conference about it and such. Um, but on a totally different track, you know, our generation was known as the me generation. Supposedly, we just all wanted to go work on Wall Street. And that label just seemed misplaced to me. Um, I thought the problem wasn't the generation because I felt like everyone I knew, myself included, were just searching for something that would give us a way to assume a big responsibility and make a real difference in the world. And I thought the problem is is really the recruiters, all of which were investment banks and management consulting firms at the time, I mean, literally. And that's what gave me this idea, you know, why aren't we being recruited as aggressively to commit two years to teach in our highest poverty communities as we were being recruited at the time to commit two years to work on Wall Street. Um, and I just became possessed with that idea. I thought it would have a huge impact in the short run. We'd be channeling all this energy and talent into our most underserved communities. And at the same time, I thought those two years, the, your first two years out of college were so influential. I knew all these upperclassmen who'd gone to work at those banks only because they had no idea what else they were going to do. And they all went to business school. And it was clear they were going to go right back into those firms. And I thought, how powerful would it be to take our kind of future leaders and have their first two years out of college be working in schools with kids in, and families in our, our most economically disadvantaged communities. I just thought it would shape their priorities, their decisions every year thereafter. It would change the consciousness of our country. So um, that was the idea. I honestly think this was an idea that was just meant to happen. It, it was one of those things. I spent my thesis researching this idea and, and developing a plan for it and and really looking for it because I was just convinced that someone else must be pursuing this. It was just so obvious for the time. Like the timing was really surreally perfect. You know, there really was this mood on college campuses. There was unrest. I mean, literally the real leaders out there were just searching for something. They, they really were. They were searching for something that they weren't finding. Um, 
there were huge teaching shortages, um, like literally headlines every year. I mean, I've never seen anything like it since actually with, you know, a thousand openings at the beginning of the year, like just classrooms with no teachers in New York City and Los Angeles. Um, and, and corporate America had come together and they'd had this big summit that Fortune magazine hosted and they'd all made this big commitment. This is during my senior year that they were gonna take on education in the United States. Um, so there were just many things that, that made, it, made it right. And I think, um, I also think this is just an idea that, that really magnetized people. It, it didn't magnetize everyone. I mean, there were many people who thought this was a little crazy, but there were a lot of people who just heard this and thought, yeah. And, and I think that accounts for the fact that we had, you know, a quick start. Um, uh, I sent out my thesis to corporate executives quoted in that the article in Fortune magazine about that summit and a few others who I'd randomly selected just because I'd heard of them. I mean, literally, this is how I had the huge advantage, as I probably said in, in the UNC commencement speech, of inexperience. I mean, there's a level of naivete in this, but I just wrote letters to corporate CEOs, like the head of Delta Airlines or Coca-Cola, and also the people in the article. And I, one of those executives agreed to meet with me and, and actually made a seed grant. Um, and that enabled me to spend my summer trying to build support for this idea. And I would sit in this donated office that some other executive had said I could use in Manhattan. And I would send a hundred letters and get a couple of people to say, sure, I'll meet with you. And then I would work out from those people. And by the end of the summer, I'd met quite a few people, like people who are potential funders, people in school districts, people in the kind of broader education community. And there were lots of people who had said, this is a good idea. It's great. The college students will never do it. I mean, people were just so skeptical about this generation. And because that was the one thing I had reason to have confidence about, I just decided I'm gonna show these people. <laughs> and um, I worked together with a group of other very recently graduated folks to basically launch a grassroots recruitment campaign, I mean, which consisted of flyers under doors. I'm sure that makes me seem very, very old. Um, but, you know, there was not email at the time. Um, and we had 2,500 people apply within within four months. And that led, people could not believe that, you know, it led to news stories about this. And one thing led to another and, and ultimately, you know, one year after I graduated, I was looking out on an auditorium full of 500 um, people, recent college graduates who had signed up to be the charter core members of, of Teach for America. Um, so, so, you know, I think that there's much more to be said about that first year, um, but, but I really don't view that first year as the true kind of entrepreneurial story of Teach for America, actually. I think it's, it's more so what came after that. Um, I realized, you know, I thought the first year was challenging and it was stressful. It's just always stressful. Like any startup is so stressful because you never know, is it really going to come together? Um, but it really paled in comparison with what came next. There were just such immense learning curves really on every front. Um, programmatically, you know, it turned out I had totally underestimated what it would take to actually fulfill the mission that, that I was attempting to fulfill. So I was just recounting the incredible learning curves, the massive learning curves programmatically, um, huge organizational learning curves as well. Um, are you all, can you hear me again? Yes. Yes? Okay. Um, you know, I, I, you know, obviously had no idea how to manage an organization and I came to believe, in fact, I started with real kind of, thinking that we didn't need to be great at management because everyone would be so aligned and committed to the mission that everyone would perform at high levels. And I just came to realize that, you know what, whether or not we accomplished our mission was going to have most to do with how, how good a manager I became. Um, so I went through huge learning curves on that front. Um, 
there were huge learning curves around, you know, just trying to find a financial strategy that would enable us to grow and sustain the organization. Um, and also huge political learning curves, which we're still, you know, we're still climbing learning curves on, on all fronts. Um, um, but just through a process of just, you know, constant reflection and continuous improvement. Um, and I really do think that's probably the biggest, the biggest reason Teach for America is where it is today is just the power of perseverance and, and the power of time. Um, you know, 23 years is a long time. And if you just stay with it and keep being committed to doing better and better and better, a lot of things do work out over time. Not that we don't have huge challenges and still face them every day. Um, but as I guess you've heard, I mean, we've grown, you know, massively from where we started, certainly, um, with 10,000 teachers plus now in, in the midst of their two years in 46 regions across the country. Our budget is about $300 million at Teach for America. Um, and I'm also spending, you know, more and more of my time at Teach for All, um, supporting the development of this model in, in other countries and have become just completely inspired about the possibility of uh, a global network of, of organizations that ultimately fuel thriving movements to ensure educational opportunity for all in their countries and that are moving more and more quickly because they're fueling each other. Um, Teach for All is in 25 countries just five years into its development and, and growing. Um, so I think in all of this, I mean, I didn't start out thinking this was going to be my lifelong endeavor. I didn't have a different plan. I didn't really, I didn't think about it. You know, I just was focused on the immediate. Um, but, you know, it's clearly come to be my life's work. Um, and what's kept me and so many of my colleagues, I mean, I think people look at somehow at the statistics around what our alums end up doing and are sort of surprised because people do come in thinking, I'm gonna do this for two years, but two thirds of our folks end up staying long-term in education and of the people who leave, you know, half of them have jobs that relate in one way or another. Um, and I think there's there are some common learnings um, that have kept us in this. Um, and, you know, most fundamentally, I think it's just the, the realization that actually we can solve this problem. You know, it, I think about where we were 20 years ago and, and um, you know, this issue of, of low educational outcomes in low income communities seemed so absolutely intractable. Um, and the thought was, and our own thought was, you know, we'd have to solve poverty to really solve this problem and we should try to do something about it but the thought that we could actually make a meaningful difference in in solving such a gargantuan problem um, in our lifetimes i mean i'm not sure we truly were focused on that 20 years ago um, and yet what i've learned along the way from our teachers our alumni and many other colleagues in in the urban and rural communities in which we work is that we actually can do this. Um, and I've also come to realize that our effort is not certainly the only piece of this puzzle. I mean, there's so much that needs to happen, but it is a fundamentally important piece of the puzzle. And um, just to say a, a little bit about it, you know, initially, my, my initial like climb in this, in this learning curve around, you know, how do we actually solve this problem came actually from some rare Teach for America Corps members who in their classrooms were showing what was possible. Like they were taking kids who were way behind, who were facing inconceivable challenges, challenges that to many of us would seem inconceivable. Maybe some of you have experienced your own life experience, but, and they would take that class of kids and put them on a meaningfully different trajectory than what, what they entered the class on. I mean, literally putting classes of kids. I, and I actually, because you all are in North Carolina, think about one of the teachers I spent a lot of time with uh, who had a huge influence on me was, was a woman named Tammy Sutton, who, when I first met her, was a teacher teaching eighth grade writing uh, in rural North Carolina, in Gaston, North Carolina. And she was attaining these astronomical results with her kids. She was getting them to be like the 
the top quartile in writing ability. It's really, really hard to start with kids who haven't had the literacy foundations that they need and get them to that level. Um, and I went and spent time with her and realized what was possible just from watching her teach. And I realized there was no magic about it, that, that she was just doing what a great leader would do. Like she had her kids on a mission um, to, to actually attain academic excellence. And she was doing whatever it took, spending a ton of time with her kids and being incredibly goal oriented in the classroom in, in order to attain those results. And, and then I watched, you know, it still seems a little inconceivable that, you know, there could be a million Tammy Suttons because, you know, we have a million teachers in our country who um, are working with the, the fifth of the kids in our country who are low income kids. Um, and, and it also seems inconceivable that you could do that every year. I mean, two years in, you know, in the classroom of a few folks, sure, but like whole careers of a million people, it, it doesn't seem feasible. But then I watched people like Tammy go off and start whole schools that were set up differently, um, that were set up based on what they'd learned it would take to meet the needs of kids and move them ahead in their classrooms. Um, and, you know, these schools have a different mission than most public schools have. Like they're actually setting out not just to put learning opportunities in front of kids, but to ensure that every one of their kids gets on a path, gains the academic skills, the character strengths necessary to get to and through college, despite what their socioeconomic background might predict. And they go after that with a level of energy and discipline that's just very, very rare to find in, in a school. Um, and, you know, today we have maybe 300, 400 of those schools that I would call truly transformational schools, schools that are taking whole buildings full of kids whose background predicts one thing and putting them on a track to a completely different set of professional options and, and kind of life outcomes. So I'm seeing in the hands of those folks, um, you know, evidence that we actually can solve this problem. And now the question is, how do we scale it up? Can we get to the point where in whole communities, we can provide all of our low income kids with the kind of educational opportunities and supports that will enable them to gain the tools to break the cycle of poverty. And while we don't yet have a community level proof point, um, you know, we have communities that we had given up on and we forget, but 10 years ago, no one had any hope for the New York City public schools. Six years ago, we had no hope in New Orleans. And in those two cities, we've seen really, really dramatic progress for kids. Um, the graduation rate in New York among African-American Latino kids is up 20 points from seven years ago. Fourth graders are a full year ahead of where they were in their performance in New York uh, seven years ago. And this is a massive system with 1.1 million kids, 80,000 teachers, 1,700 school buildings. In New Orleans, the percentage of kids who are meeting the state standards has more than doubled in four years. These are really critical, critical, you know, it's, it's a lot of progress. There's much more that needs to be done. But if you're a parent, a kid growing up in these cities, um, it, these kind of changes actually do make a meaningful difference in, in your life. Um, so I guess I've just seen lots of evidence that we can actually solve this problem. And the other thing I've seen is that not only is there no magic to this, um, there's no one solution as much as all of our kind of political leaders and others would like there to be one. I mean, we're not going to give every kid a computer and solve the problem. We're not going to give every parent a voucher and solve the problem. There's just no one thing. But wherever you see the kind of meaningful change that I've seen in the classrooms of the Tammy Suttons of the world, in schools that like those that I've described, in, in these communities, always there's, there's really strong, committed leadership who understand basically what Tammy Sutton learned in her teaching experience, understand the potential of kids, understand what it takes to meet their extra needs, and, and understand that radical change is possible, and as a result, will act differently. Um, and that fundamental insight is, is what fuels our sense of urgency to say, you know what, we can solve the problem. We will only solve it if we can reach the point where not just a few, but many, of our country's future leaders decide to channel their energy against it. Um, we need them for two years and for as many years as we can get them to 
channel their energy into classrooms for the sake of the kids they reach, for the sake of the lessons they learn. And we need them every year thereafter. We need them, many of them, to stay in the system. We need others to go pursue political office policy, others to become our business leaders who have such a huge influence on our policies, um, and, and other civic leaders. And, and so that's what leads us to say we have got to get bigger and, and, and better every, every year. Um, and, and I'm also just so excited, as I said before, about um, the possibilities of, of a global network to accelerate progress. I'm absolutely sort of amazed to discover that this problem that we have here exists everywhere. And, and it looks the same everywhere, which means the solutions are shareable. And so the thought of, you know, all these different countries channeling their top leaders against this problem as part of a network where people can share solutions, it's just going to hugely accelerate the pace of change. Um, so, so, so I think I'll I'll close with just one one other thought, which kind of brings together why I'm so passionate about this particular endeavor of ours and, and your own focus on entrepreneurship. Um, and it's just to say, I feel like I've seen firsthand and every day I see more evidence of it. I just see the power of and the role of pioneers in this. Um, I don't know if you all are familiar with the story of Rod Bannister, um, who was the first person to run a four minute mile. It's so interesting because before he ran it, no one thought it was possible. And in the year after he ran it, dozens of people broke that record. And, you know, history is is littered with stories like that. FedEx, no one thought you could do overnight delivery, and then FedEx did it, and everyone realized, you know, it was possible. And I feel like this journey has been has been that same story. We didn't know it was possible to do what Tammy Sutton did until she and a few others did it and then everyone realized oh that's it's possible and that's what it takes we didn't know it was possible to have a whole school that would be able to put kids you know quadruple plus college graduation rates until a few guys started the first of them and then everyone else started adapting them in, in different ways um, we didn't know it was possible to have massive systemic change across a big system until Mayor Bloomberg and Joel Klein did what they did in New York and everyone started realizing, oh, you know, it is possible. So that too is, is another thing that fuels us to believe like we're going to do this. I Not two months goes by when I don't meet someone else who has come up with some new way of getting at the systemic issues around this issue. And then once one person does it, it just spreads like crazy, not only in this country, but now I'm realizing all around the world. The, the schools I described are launching now in countries all around the world. So it's just, it's very, very powerful to pioneer, you know, new approaches and new ideas. And, and the impact is just, just such ripple effects. So, um, so that's why I'm excited to do what I do and excited to, to see your interest both in Teach for America and also in, in entrepreneurship generally. Wonderful. So Wendy, we actually have some questions already. They, from their laptop, can send questions up to a screen here on the, on the, uh, in the classroom and we can begin to feed you some of them, if you don't mind, and then uh, there'll be more coming. So the first question is, um, given its, its profound influence and opportunity, can you share your thoughts on the impending Supreme Court decision of Fisher versus UT Austin on affirmative action? Um, yeah, and I don't know if you saw my op-ed on this yesterday in, in the Huffington Post. Um, but Teach for America actually filed an amicus brief in this case, which is something you know we've never done in, a, in another Supreme Court case, um, just because we are literally terrified about the impact of that. I mean, I, I'm terrified about it as a citizen in general, but you know, I'm worried about the impact of it even on the broader effort to improve the K-12 system. Um, and I say that because I've actually come to see 
over the last 20 years that we do not have a chance. I mean, as much as I believe we can solve this problem in our lifetime, this problem of, of educational inequity, we don't have a chance of doing it if the effort to solve that problem isn't extremely representative of the communities in which we're working. And, and 90, 95% of the kids we're working with are African American, Latino, or, or Native American. They're, that we will not be successful if the effort to tackle this issue isn't ultimately led by the folks who are who are experiencing the problem. And, and I believe that just because of what I've seen over time about both the additional you know, impact that you have the potential to have when you share the backgrounds of your kids, um, but at least as much so what I've seen around the broader, you know, it, it's, it's, I see the effort moving much more quickly and, and in a much better way um, when we have diverse leadership groups that include people who just by way of their own life experience have a different level of grounding in the actual problem, a different level of personal urgency, a different level of credibility in these very diverse communities. So this effort needs to be diverse and yet our college campuses are painfully non-diverse. And you know, not even like looking at the top 350 colleges in terms of selectivity, 5% of the seniors are African-American, 6% are Latino. Um, so we have to be a lot more diverse than those campuses. And those diversity rates are going to plummet if we, if, if colleges can't look at race as one factor in a holistic process. Um, and, and my op-ed, I, I basically just shared that, you know, we need to get beyond thinking about this is a choice between diversity and merit. Um, there are such systemic inequities in our system, we in no way have a level playing field. And we should recognize um, that for the kids in the communities we're working with, and you know, kids are three times as likely if they're African American Latino to be growing up below the poverty line. You know, if you've made it to the point where you're competitive for college admissions, um, and, and you are, are from one of those communities, you've got a whole other set of qualities that we should be valuing, uh, which which have the potential to set you up for greater life success. So you also, all of you, be glad to know that UNC filed a Mikas, our friend of the court brief, also in that case as well. So we stood with you on that one. Great. Uh, um, next question. Uh, how has Teach for America responded to criticism from teachers and schools supported by your efforts regarding their feeling that TFA supplants their efforts? Um, well, we don't, so our teachers are hired into vacancies. Um, and, you know, I think in some cases where because of the very bad economy in the last few years, we've had to see lots of teacher layoffs. And in some cases, districts will, you know, bring in Teach for America nonetheless. I think there have been a couple of those cases where there have been, you know, real flare ups. And, and honestly, they've been based on misunderstandings, which thankfully we've been able to work through over time. The reality is that districts hire new teachers every year. Even when there are layoffs, they're hiring new teachers um, because maybe the people there, having to lay off don't match the same subject areas or grade levels or teacher qualifications that they have to have. So they're going to hire someone. And we're a fraction of the people they hire in those cases. Our folks go through all the same hiring requirements. The principals are interviewing them. Um, and so in the communities, in the schools where we're working, which are typically the hardest to staff schools, um, they're treated as other new teachers would, would be in general. Um, Great, thank you. Uh, next question, what metrics can be used to measure inspiration and it, its results in teacher-student performance? Well, you know, what's exciting is there is in fact a new measure which we're about to test, um, which the Gates Foundation just through their, some of their big teacher studies, um, just discovered that student surveys, um, where you ask students actually how engaging their teachers are and, and whatnot, are more predictive of academic achievement 
than any other measure they could find. So as an example, there are all these teacher evaluation tools out there, teacher rubrics um, that people have developed. We have one. You know, there, there are many other groups that have developed these rubrics. And if you evaluate teachers based on those rubrics, those rubrics are not as predictive of academic achievement than the student surveys themselves. So this is a hugely powerful insight um, and I think has, has a lot of potential to, to enable us to, to have, you know, sort of more holistic measures. Okay, next. What do you see as America's biggest dilemma facing advancements in education and why are we still falling so far behind? Um, I believe that um, th I'm, I'm hesitating only because, I mean, this is such a massive question. Um, honestly, I really believe, you know, what I said before, which is that this is a, this is a function of leadership. And when I say that, I don't just mean you know, it's, it's like in a company, um, you would never hire people off the street to run GE. Like you develop those people over time. Like you bring in people who you believe have leadership potential and they move through a pipeline. Like they, they gain new understandings every year until they're ready to become the CEO, right? We need to develop educational leadership in this country. And, and when I say educational leadership, I mean the people in the system, our teachers, our school principals, our school superintendents, and the people who are creating the policy context that our schools are operating in, like our political leaders, our policy folks, and the civic leaders who are influencing them as well. Um, honestly, I think most people have no idea what has actually been learned in many urban and rural communities across the country in the last 20 years. I, I don't believe that people know what we've learned, not just Teach for America, but the kind of broader effort to say, we've got to take this on. There's been so much that's learned, that's been learned. And I think if, if we had leaders at every level and in every kind of sector who were actually grounded in those lessons, who had come to realize that, oh, we can have life-changing change for kids in our lifetimes. We don't have to wait. We can do it for the kids who are in our schools today. We don't have to live in the land of the incremental. We don't have to say that our big goal is that 3% more of our kids will be proficient on the state tests. We can actually say, we're going to put our kids on a path to college, to and through college. Um, we know how to describe what it takes to get that to happen. Um, I think if more people understood that, then we would operate differently. So then when you see a Chicago, you know, you have political leaders, union leaders, system leaders, business leaders, civic advocates, all operating differently. They would all realize, you know what, we have all got to change and it's on us. Because once you realize you can solve the problem, you realize we've got a moral imperative to change so that we can solve that problem. So that is honestly what I think our biggest issue is. And it, it again is why that you can't just think I care about education, I wanna be a leader. No, you've gotta gain the foundational perspectives. And I think there's, I think the best way to do that is, is to commit to teaching successfully in this context. Like it's just the foundation for everything else. And I think we need more and more people to do that. And that, that's, once we get to critical mass, we'll start seeing outcomes improve in an aggregate sense. Great. This next question is emblematic of what we all love so much about UNC. Uh, and it reads as follows. Out of the first 16 classes, you have been the only female entrepreneur. Being a woman, have you faced any obstacles being an entrepreneur? Oh, that's painful. Um, um, you know, I'm constantly wondering <laughs> if some of the things that happened to me would really happen to me if I was a guy. Um, although I don't spend too much energy wondering that, obviously, or I, I wouldn't have time for anything else. Um, I don't know. I We have built an incredibly supportive environment 
at Teach for America, you know, and, and try to become be more and more inclusive every day. And obviously I can shape that environment. And so I'm operating in a world that, you know, I can thrive in. I think when you enter the external world, um, you know, I think, you know, I, I've been able to obviously navigate this. I, I think, I think the challenges, and it's on all of us, it's on us as well. I mean, I look at, I look at the people who come out of Teach for America, you know, 70% of the folks who come in are women and 30% are men. Um, and yet, if you look at, well, let's look at the diversity of the school leaders out there and the, the school system leaders. We've contributed to some of that diversity, I have to say. But, but you know, it's, it's even in our own ranks, we see these issues play out. So I, I think it's on all of us to step back and really think, and, and there's quite a number of efforts out there to do this about what are the barriers and what are the extra supports that we need to provide to ensure that, you know, women are absolutely, you know, motivated to and supported to assume those, the, the you know, leadership roles. Great. Um, in your book, you criticize the use of technology at the School of the Future. Should we truly blame uh, the technology or the teachers for for not using the technology effectively? Well, what I was blaming there was the instinct to believe that a silver bullet solution would solve the problem. The people who built that school did so under the illusion that technology was going to solve the problem. That's why they didn't launch a principal search and didn't have a principal until a month before the building opened. That's why they didn't put so much energy into figuring out who they were going to recruit and select to be those teachers. Um, so that was what I was criticizing. I actually really believe that we're completely underutilizing technology in this. And, and you know, I, I think it has huge potential to accelerate progress in, in numerous areas from student engagement to actually enabling us to gain better understandings of where kids are and, and to get the parents and the kids and the teachers all aligned around and understanding that. I, I've seen no better motivator for kids than being really transparent about them, about, with them, about where they are in their progress. And I think technology has, has a huge role to play. So it, it wasn't a comment about technology. I think we need to invest technology. Um, but I think we need to resist the temptation of believing that that's, that's going to solve it. And, and this is a very real thing. I mean, I don't know if that seems absurd to people, but if you go out and hang out in the education philanthropy conferences right now, you will see why that's an important point to make. I mean, people, I meet with them every day. People think this is the latest. Actually, the real silver bullet right now that we're all talking about as a country is teachers. Fix the teacher, we'll fix the problem. Read the education headlines, and that's that's the assumption. And I don't I don't buy it. I have spent 23 years learning the hard way that that's not going to do it. We need to fix schools. We need to fix school systems. Teachers are super critical. The best way to help them improve is to have very supportive, strong schools. Um, and the best way to have very supportive, strong schools is to change the way our school systems operate. Here's a, a great question. What was it like to be on the Colbert Report? Oh, my gosh. I <laughs> remember this because I have never been so terrified in my life. And it wasn't because of this poor man, Colbert, who, who didn't do anything to inspire my fear. He was very nice. It was our staff who were absolutely <laughs> petrified that whatever I was going to do on this was going to just ruin Teach for America because I'm not a funny person, et cetera. Um, so they had me so overprepped. And you know what his first question was? What is Teach for America? I thought I was going to die. I couldn't remember. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. And did you? Did he come in the green room? We, you're our second guest who is on the Colbert Report. Steve Case also was. Did he come in beforehand and explain to you that this was just an act and that he was really a nice guy and that he just did this? You know, what I heard later, I don't think he did, um, but I heard later that he was in a really 
bad mood. And so he just chucked all the scripts that his team had done for him, which is why my first question was, what is Teach for America? Um, so all the prep that we all did was all irrelevant. And Perfect. It, it, was, it, it worked out. Right. He is a funny guy. OK. How do we attract the best? Now back to a more serious realm. How do we attract the best and brightest to become teachers instead of them going into medicine or investment banking? Actually, I think you sort of talked about this, but any other thoughts about recruitment and how that? Um, well, I think, you know, more broadly than Teach for America, I mean, one thing I realized in the early days of Teach for America alongside many others was that our school systems were not recruiting. So they were under the impression that their job, that wasn't their job. They, the schools of ed, their job is to produce the teachers. So they would wait for resumes to come their way. And if they didn't get enough of them, they would have teacher shortages. And I'm actually not exaggerating. That was 100% the case. And I remember still going to a big conference and saying, you know, what we do, you all could do. Like school districts should be doing what big companies do. You should hire recruiters. They should go out and call upon people to come work in their school systems. And I still remember a very well-known, reform-minded person raising his hand and saying, I don't get it. Why should we have to do that? Accounting firms don't recruit. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, yes, they do. It's just not the way things were done. So we have seen a big shift in that. I mean, school districts are operating in a very different way in terms of this, in part because of this effort that's, that's a bunch of Teach for America alums are undertaking called the New Teacher Project to help change the way new teachers are brought into the profession more broadly. So that there's a lot more recruitment that goes on. And actually what we've seen is effective recruitment does in fact inspire very highly qualified people to, to want to do this. We've seen that through Teach for America, but we've also seen that um, in, in many of the communities where we're working. Um, that being said, I think the question's getting at sort of a broader issue, and I agree that it exists. I mean, we need to figure out how to improve the overall image of teaching, and I think that doing that will have a lot to do with, with a whole bunch of things. Um, uh, I think if we can change the way our schools function, the wrap on teaching will change. I mean, these schools I've been talking about, these very high performing schools, the people in those schools are generally so fired up about their jobs, about their ability to make an impact, about the challenge, about the level of support that they have. The schools are even figuring out how to pay them more and pay them differently. Um, and, and I think all of that is, I mean, we need to rethink everything about how we recruit, select, train, support, compensate, um, teachers and, and how we enable teachers to make their own voices heard in the, in the broader discussions and, and decision-making process. So uh, just as a sidebar right here for many of you, you may not know, but we have at UNC now have a minor in education. This is the first year that we've ever done it. It means you can major in biology or economics or history or art or whatever it is, do a minor in education and maybe even increase your chances of uh, getting to not only getting recruited by Teach for America, but succeeding afterwards. And the thought is, just as Wendy said, we want to make it easy for the best and the brightest of our kids to get some background in education uh, prior to hitting the classroom. And this is a program that has been in the works, as Wendy knows, for several years. And I think we've got 20 or 30 in it uh, oversubscribed this year, but you should those of you who get inspired by this should look into that minor in education. Great. So uh, do you believe that college is the right choice for all or most people, or should other options be valued as well? Well, I think that now the reality in our country now is that in most communities, you need a college degree in order to really have access to the range of professional options. Um, you know, you see in different countries really strong apprenticeship programs and other programs um, that do give people other viable options. And I think, you know, gosh, it's such a heavy lift to think about how we go from where we are in our country, you know, to the point where we actually have the kind of options that, that exist in some other countries. Um, 
but but I think it's an interesting thing to consider, and that and that communities could really take that on in a, in a way that could make a real difference. My fear is that right now, you know, we have an assumption that oh, you know, let's let's create a vocational track, um, and our low income kids can do that, and you know, our other kids can go to college, and it, it's just based on such flawed assumptions about the different potential of kids and whatnot. And I, I'm I do worry about about that. Um, you know, I think what we should do is really go at giving kids in our K-12 system, meeting them all with the kinds of expectations and the extra supports that do set them up to get to and through college. Um, because right now, that's that's really the path to, to having to to having real options. Uh, should reform primarily be focused on educational structure or? Is socioeconomic structure the real problem? Um, so this is interesting. I mean, and to the point about pioneers, I mean, I was talking with some of our alums from way back in the day who've done incredible pioneering things in education, and they were reflecting on this because our assumption and my own assumption early on was that these folks, I mean, we thought they would go out and change the world after their two years, but we didn't think that they would necessarily do that from within education. We thought they would take on economic development and, you know, the quality of public health and the quality of social services and the quality of schools, like everything. And what these folks were saying, I think it was Chris Barbick actually, who, who, you know, started one of those transformational schools and grew the number of them and is now running a school system in, in Tennessee and is, is just extraordinary. He's like, you know what happened to us is we realized we actually can make a massive difference in education. And the path to making a massive difference in these other fields wasn't as clear. Like we didn't know, you know, people haven't figured out yet how to improve whole economies in urban and rural areas, despite lots of efforts. So we realized as he articulated, like actually we don't have to wait to solve poverty to make a radical difference in the lives of kids who are in schools today. And I think that's what has led to a lot of these folks actually staying in the system. And I, I do believe what they're showing us is, you know, we really can make a huge difference by basically redefining what a school's role should be, broadening that mandate, um, and, and producing a generation of kids who will go on and provide all sorts of leadership to ex continue working on education and take on a lot of other problems as well. That being said, I mean, just quickly, the role of pioneers, again, I mean, we're doing more at Teach for America to try to foster among our, our alumni the kind of pioneering leadership that we've seen within education in the social welfare system as, as one example, uh, and, and just more broadly than schools, because we do think, who knows what we don't know? And all we need is one pioneer to figure out, here's the solution to social services or health care or you know, whatever, and, and that'll spread like wildfire, too. Great. Um do you support the Common Core standards? I really do. I think, um, you know, I think it it has huge potential. Um, you know, there are some reports out saying that, you know, when we make the full shift to the Common Core, which are these very rigorous internationally benchmarked standards, you know, that the day's kids are maybe I mean, it depends on the subject area, but maybe learning 30% of what this new curriculum represents. So I, I think that it will, I think it's it's going to be an incredibly important step. Um, it's also going to do a lot to get at the concern that I think we all share about sort of the dumbing down of curriculum and the kind of focus on rote tests. Like this is so much focused on, you know, true rigor and, and fostering critical thinking and such. And, and so I think it's a huge and important step forward and a really tough step forward when you think about, you know, how to actually basically retrain our, our educators to be able to teach to this new, new curriculum. Great. Um, what are your thoughts on the reverse classroom model? Uh, meaning flipping the class so that the teachers, what, what do you mean by that? The idea of getting a lot of the lecture online or whatever and then uh, showing up in class for more like discussion kinds of stuff, that kind of thing. I think it's, a, I think it's great. It seems like a better utilization of, of 
everyone's time. Um, and I think the Khan Academy efforts to do that have had good results so far. So I, I think it's, it has huge potential. So what about the next question has to do with vocational education and uh, the push in many countries toward, like the UK, toward vocational training instead of a college degree. Um, and the concern or the question is, what's your view on the long-term effect of this kind of movement toward vocational uh, education on the country's workforce and on the country in general? You know, I, I think we should be very careful, but I must say I don't feel like I know enough to be an informed advocate one way or the other. I, I think I'm so, we are so far from even preparing our kids in K-12 for a good vocational system. And, and I don't think I've made that point loudly enough in this class. I mean, I've hardly made it at all, but we should ground ourselves in that because you know, the, the reality is, just to be clear, a fifth of our kids are living below the poverty line. Half of them will graduate at all from high school, and the half who do have an eighth grade skill level. Eighth grade skill level. So the kids we think are making it through high school, this is 16 million kids so who are under the poverty line. Eight million of them don't make it through high school. The eight million who do have an eighth grade skill level, um, they are set up not for a lot. 8% of our low income kids get through college now. So we need to make so much progress there. And, and I think my real thought, I mean, I, I think that a lot of people should be thinking about higher ed and vocational ed. Um, and I think we just need to keep as much energy and resources channeled at K-12 as we possibly can muster at the same time. Like we're gonna need to do, to do all of this. So there's another question about uh, international, and I w wanna throw in that, uh, and maybe this will be useful as you talk about a little bit more about your international efforts, your day with one of our students, Wyatt Bruton in China, which uh, I guess you spent some time in his classroom in China, and Wyatt was one of our early graduates of our entrepreneurship program here at UNC. Okay, that's amazing, yeah. So how, how did that go, and how are the efforts going internationally? Um, they're going really well. I mean, I think I said we launched Teach for All five years ago. It, it was really inspired by just requests from these social entrepreneurs in different countries who wanted to pursue this model and were looking for help. Uh, from Teach for America and from the first adaptation of Teach for America in the UK called Teach First. Um, and we literally were becoming overwhelmed by the requests and realized we needed a solution and ultimately stepped back and, and developed a plan for, for a separate organization that would work to accelerate the impact of this model. I, I, even five years ago, it's such a short time, but I actually could not have, and I really didn't anticipate what we would learn through, over the last five years. I think there's such an assumption, and I, I certainly had it, that, I mean, education is local. I, did not occur to me that whatever we had learned in the U.S. was really going to have that many implications for India. I mean, it seems like such a foreign context in, in so many different ways. Um, when you, I don't know how many people have been to India, but you realize, oh my gosh, as much as our country believes that Indians are well-educated because it's such a massive country, I guess, and a lot of them do end up in our higher ed system, like the fact is, you know, maybe three or four percent of the Indian population has the kind of education that would begin to, you know, describe what, what the folks in your room have. Um, so it, it's just a place where there are massive, I mean, the disparities are just massive. And, and yet what I've learned over time is that all over the world in such diverse places, whether it's, you know, in Latin America, in, in, European countries where you perceive there to be really strong social safety nets and whatnot, wherever. First of all, socioeconomic background predicts educational outcomes. This is true with almost no exceptions in, even in countries like Japan and Korea where you'd never, where you might not think it, it to be true. Beyond that though, the problem looks so similar from place to place. 
when you spend time in classrooms, you spend time in schools, you talk to governmental officials, you realize, oh my goodness, this is the same problem everywhere. It's driven by the same mindsets, the same prevailing notions, the same patterns exist everywhere. And the reason for hope and optimism in this is that once you realize that, you realize the solutions are gonna be shareable. Um, and what I've seen is the power of, first of all, channeling brilliant people, committed people, and somehow this, again, this idea is magnetic and it's as magnetic in India or Peru or you know South Africa as it is in the United States. Um, so it draws brilliant, committed people in very diverse cultures that inspire different ways of thinking. And as a result, there's lots of innovation. But if the problem is the same, that means those innovations can be shared. So the biggest driver of progress at Teach for America in the last two years has been what we've learned from these Teach for All programs, which is a lot to say because we've been around for 23 years and some of them have been around for two or three. Um, and we are seeing that at every level, the organization level, the level of teachers in classrooms, the level of alumni in terms of the innovations they're pioneering, there's just incredible power. So I really believe we're going to see ultimately just a thriving global movement to ensure educational opportunity for all that's moving a lot more quickly than, than these individual movements are, are right now. Wonderful. So before we thank Wendy, just one final comment, and that is you often ask for what's the takeaway. And I think today it should be very clear to all of you that great ideas are important, ex uh, all kinds of execution is important, but ultimately in these entrepreneurial enterprises, it's almost always about somebody. It's almost always about somebody. And if you didn't get that before, Hopefully you got it today. The reason TFA exists and is what it is is because of the person you just spent the last hour and 15 minutes with. And you will see time and again, whether it's Steve Jobs or Wendy Copper, and obviously she couldn't do it without many, many, many other people, and she'll be quick to say that. But what we want you to do is to be exposed to people who have and can change the world and you have just met one. So with that, I want to thank Wendy and allow the class to thank her as well. <laughs>